Thank you for joining the Lakeside Light Podcast. It's light to help you see your way and a light version of our full televised Sunday services, which you can find on our website at lakesidechurch.org. This audio podcast is a weekly sermon message of intellectual, spiritual, and sometimes humorous nourishment for the road. Enjoy. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you maybe knew it was coming soon. I, um, I have to open a sermon by telling you about my puppy. Um, as you may know, my family has a new puppy, and her name is Polly, uh, which is short for Tripoli, which is a family game that we love. Um, and Polly is about uh, 12 weeks old now, about 12 weeks old, and, and she has been wonderful. We are already in love with her but she's definitely a puppy. And um, one of the biggest challenges for us right now is that she is what you might call mouthy. You know, like, um, she likes to bite things. I, you should know, I have no experience dog training. I am no good at dog training. I'm trying. Dog training is not my strength. Um, but Will, my husband, has been doing a really fabulous job and the rest of us are trying to keep up with him, and he's helping us learn as we go. Um, so we've all been learning a lot about how to deal with a puppy who really wants to treat your uh, shoe or skirt or arm or whatever as a tug toy. Um, okay, so the main thing is you cannot just tell the puppy no. Right? You can't just say stop or take away whatever the puppy is trying to bite or chew or mouth or whatever, you have to also offer them an alternative, right? You have to like carry a rope at your side to offer immediate access to a chew toy for them as an alternative to whatever they want to chew on, right? Getting the puppy away from an unwanted behavior is not enough. You have to immediately offer them something else, a desirable alternative behavior. Just off is no good unless you also offer them something that is okay to not on. Puppies, it turns out, hate a void, right? Which, oof, feels pretty relatable, right? When have you been given a no in life? And how have you maybe tried to turn that into an Alternative, yes. Not this, okay, fine, but that's okay because of this, right? How many of us, like puppies, would rather chew on the wrong thing than chew on nothing at all? God is not a puppy trainer, of course. And sometimes it feels like God is pulling us toward purpose toward something good, toward some meaning, uh, calling us into a place or a relationship or an activity. Sometimes it feels that way, but sometimes an alternative path does not draw us away from what we are currently doing. Sometimes God is simply calling us away from. When in your life have you felt called or pushed from, from a job maybe, or a person, or a relationship, from a community? Are you being called away from anything right now? So this is our third week exploring the idea of vocation in our lives and in our tradition as reformed Christians. We've been We've been thinking a lot about God's calling in a different way. We're trying to think about God's calling less by just thinking of the ways God calls us to be a noun or to do a verb, uh, 
But speaking of God's call in terms of prepositions, those words that connect the nouns or connect the verbs, reimagining call through prepositions, I hope, allows us to broaden our view, maybe to let go of a more narrow understanding of our lives, vocations, our callings, uh, Sherry Oosting is a, a peer of mine from seminary, actually, and, and she now directs a project for young adult leadership out of Princeton Seminary where they guide vocational discernment uh, for young adults in small cohorts. And as I was preparing for this series, I spoke with Sherry, uh, partly because she introduced me to the idea of prepositions. Um, she talked about how important it has been in her work to expand the idea of vocation. She said, too often we think of God's call as a tightrope we have to walk. What if instead it's more like a balloon that we inhabit? How often in your life have you thought of what God wanted from you as a tightrope you had to walk? And what does it feel like instead to think of it as a space, a broader space you can inhabit. Now, if we think about call as a tightrope we have to walk, we come by it honestly. At first blush, many of the stories about call we turn to in scripture or in history look like stories of someone who somehow managed to walk the straight and narrow path that was led by God. But many of our go-to call stories really begin with or have crucial turning points within them where God is calling these people or communities away from and calling them away from or from really without a clear alternative path. Take, of course, some of these classic call stories, Abram, Moses, Jesus, when we first meet Abram, he and his wife Sarai are good and settled in Haran. This is in chapter 11 in Genesis. We find out about all of the descendants after the Tower of Babel. And Abram and Sarai have already lived long, settled lives in the land of Cana. Before the story has kicked into gear, we learn that Abram is 75 years old. We don't know much more about them than that. And the first thing God says to Abram is, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. Before promising children, before naming the stars or the grains of sand as descendants, before any of that, before making anything resembling a clear path forward, God calls Abram away. God calls Abram away from everything he has known. So much of Abraham and Sarah's story revolves around them kind of living in, inhabiting in this balloon of wandering. We know how the story develops and how it ends, but from Genesis chapter 12 through to pretty much Genesis chapter 21, the only call to Abram that is clear is that he is being called away from his old life. Probably the most notable story of call in our Hebrew scriptures, one that you often hear of as an example of this story of God calling someone to a specific purpose and then that call being affirmed throughout their lives is this story of Moses, right? In Exodus 3, God offers Moses this enviable gift of a burning bush. Moses' purpose becomes clear. And God tells him, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. How many of us have yearned for that miraculous fire and the clarity of a burning bush like the one Moses was given? But Moses' story begins very differently than that clear purpose. In chapter 2 of Exodus, yes, uh, we have this story of a baby in a basket but when we first meet Moses as a grown-up, the story is about a grave error that he has made 
and its severe consequences. In chapter 2, verse 11 of Exodus, we meet grown-up Moses one day after Moses had grown up. He went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The opening story of Moses' adulthood is where he has committed one of the greatest sins he could commit. And then Moses quickly realizes that he, in fact, had be seen, we, been seen. We learn quite quickly that other slaves had witnessed this, and so he flees. Moses is called away from Egypt. He's called away from his people. Before he is the Moses who lets his people go, he is the Moses who names his own child Gershom, a name that means a stranger there. Yes, Moses experiences a clear call and a spoken purpose, but first, he is called away from everything he knows. First, he lives for years in the grief and remorse of a mistake and in the complexity of being an alien residing in a foreign land. That's how he describes himself in chapter 2, verse 22. Even those standard bearers for what it is to be called first were called from. And then in today's gospel reading, we have John's version of this story about Jesus, a story we see in almost all of our gospels where Jesus walks on the water, the disciples are in a boat, it's a storm, and Jesus meets them and calms the sea. In the Matthew version, Peter also tries to walk on water. Maybe you remember that from a few months ago. In the John passage, it's fairly straightforward. They end up on the other side safely. And I love this story of Jesus walking on water, calming the storms. But today, I want us to notice the verse that immediately comes before this story for John. In John, first Jesus feeds this crowd of 5,000. That same story precedes the, the walking on water story in all of our synoptic gospels. But in John, he then connects these stories by saying, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king... He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Before Jesus is able to walk on the water, before Jesus is able to continue his ministry, he recognizes that he is called from one version of ministry. He's called away from a version of ministry where his people crown him their kind of king. This appears in the other Gospels as well, sometimes in different places within the story. It's earlier in Mark. But at some point early in Jesus' ministry, before anyone can begin to understand what he is going to be called to, first, Jesus has to make it clear what he is being called away from. He must actively move away from the lure of earthly kingship. And his disciples, meanwhile, while in this story they find themselves adrift at sea, just as Jesus has called them away from the lives they knew, from their fishing, from their families, from any security, they too find themselves adrift before knowing where they are called to. They have been called away from first. They have been called away from proximity to earthly power. Perhaps they thought they would be the disciples of this earthly king and were part of the crowd trying to make Jesus become that. They've been called away from what they thought, what they knew, what they wanted. And beyond that, all they can see around them is a storm. What is it like to be called from without knowing where you're being called to. Cahalan, who I've been leaning on through this idea of prepositions as vocation, writes, to be 
called from entails moving away. An ending before a new beginning is clear. This preposition captures times of transition when you may have more clarity about the from than the to. And she tells the stories of being called from, especially mindful of the ways that brings real grief. Kyle tells the story of Karen, who was called away from her marriage after uh, her husband's infidelity. She writes, Karen felt anger, jealousy, rage, hurt, but also shame, guilt, and blame. The emotions come like a roller coaster. One minute you're raging, another minute weeping. Karen was losing Keith, she writes, the dream of a future together, the family she had known, and the identity of being a married person. Cahelen also writes, we learn the rhythm of finding and losing again and again. The choice, of course, is not not to attach to people, places, or things. Rather, the life task we learn is how to attach to whom and what we love, relinquish the attachment when it is lost, which does not mean forgetting it, and reconstruct a meaningful life. It sounds easy, but we all know that the loss of an object, a relationship, a job, a marriage, an identity, or a community is painful. The death of a loved one draws us into some of the deepest grief we experience. There's a pilgrimage involved, a wandering aimlessly at times, the second phase of a life transition, the in-between time. Eventually, the journey of grief enters a third phase, the challenge of reconstructing our lives and finding a new sense of purpose and meaning. God's callings are all along the pathway. Friends, it's been another week along our own pathways and along our shared pathways. And what a week it's been. Um, this morning, we, we awoke to new headlines about violence in Israel and in Lebanon. Violence, trauma, these things continue at home. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know, we don't know always what the path forward could or should be. How can there be peace in places where there is so much generational trauma? How can we, how can we balance the needs of so many different people and communities, especially when so often those needs seem to conflict one with the other? We don't always know what we're being called to. Even so, I believe we can hear God calling us away calling us away from violent conflict, calling us away from a rhetoric of hate, away from abuse or betrayal, and sometimes even just away from what we know. Sometimes we do not need to know exactly what God is calling us to. Sometimes it is enough to know what God is calling us from. Sometimes it is enough to know what God is calling us from and to trust that the God who calms the seas will meet us on the other side of the water. So I'm going to close with a prayer from one of my favorites, Cole Arthur Riley. In her book, Black Liturgies, she writes a section on calling. And so let us pray using her words in this prayer for those who feel their lives lack purpose. Here is that prayer. Divine intention, we come to you having never felt a sense of purpose, nothing perceivable to indicate that we were meant to be. In the absence of projects or identities or relationships that make our lives feel important, it can feel like we are drifting. Empower us to claim our lives, both for what they are and for what we want them to be. Keep us from comparing our days to the surface appearance of another's. Remind us 
the comparison is never as innocent as it first appears, that it claws at and mangles our concepts of achievement and relationship. Grant us the patience to withstand this hopelessness that we might someday look up and find intention and meaning where we thought it was void. May it be so. Amen. The Lakeside Light Podcast is a copyrighted production of Lakeside Presbyterian Church. Visit our website at lakesidechurch.org for more information. Have a great week.